That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we should be. Of knowledge. You seek his assistance 
We ask for his mercy and his forgiveness. We witness that Allah is alone in his authority over the heavens and the earth. And we witness that none are worthy of worship except him. And we witness that Muhammad, to whom the Quran was revealed, is his messenger and his servant. I, along with Imam Clemenzo Elmi, Cincinnati, Ohio, welcome you to our second annual Muslim American Leadership Day. I've been given the distinct responsibility, opportunity, and indeed honor to bring before you some very distinguished individuals who lend their support to the ongoing work of keeping the vision, the message, and the leadership tradition of our community alive in this day and time. One of the individuals that I'm going to bring before you had asked me earlier, why was I selected? And my most natural response is, because you are of the select. Those of us who are working in the capacity with which we work in the support of this leadership understand that the great majority are never the ones who carry the great matter to fruition. We can see that in play again and again in history, in the founding of nations and the building of institutions and organizations. The naysayers and doubters stand on the sidelines, watching, waiting, and scheming, and hoping for failure. We are workers, and the people that I bring before you are workers. We are not watching, we are not standing and waiting for failure. We are working for success to the destination. The first individual from Kansas City, Missouri, he came into the nation of Islam in 1970 and served in several capacities in the nation as bus driver for the Sister Clara Muhammad Elementary and Secondary School to captain of Muhammad Speaks newspaper and driving the Muhammad Speaks truck on a route from, from Chicago all the way to Houston, stopping in various arena areas in that route. He became an advertising and public relations and marketing manager for a community-based Muslim business publication and leveraged that experience into a successful 45-year advertising and sales. He spent 33 years as a U.S. government contractor with both the Departments of Defense and Justice in Leavenworth, Texas. He became and remains an ardent student of Imam Wadatin Muhammad, and now in support of the one that Imam Muhammad left to succeed him, Imam Rasulullah Al Muhammad. I bring before you Imam Khalil, Habib Khalil, and
mentions him in a portion of the Quran as reminding the children of Israel. I think it's right here. His special, uh, it's right here. special favor Michael. upon them, and that he gave them an advantage over all in the life story of the mean, over all, all systems of lives. He gave the children of Israel a special mitzvah. I found it interesting that this word mitzvah is the same word that's used so we have this as a reminder every day and 17 times a day that we are favored that we've been given a special favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah further says right after that that he tested Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ibrahim passed the test with certain words, with language. Allah says that he passed the test of language, kalim, kalima, kalimatin. With certain words, he passed the test. This word that is used when Allah says that Ibrahim fulfilled this commitment is the same words that Allah uses in the very last revelation of the Quran. And I have completed your religion. At Mamtu. So here's Ibrahim passing the pa passing the test with the best grade, he completed all the favor. He completed all the favor. So after this process, Allah says, I am making you an imam of mankind. Inna ja'iluka linasi imaman. Allah's after Ibrahim passed the test, he qualified to become the imam for all of humanity. This was his qualification. He passed the test. In my closing comments, look at the next words that Ibrahim says. You would think that he would be gloating. I passed the test. I got an A on the exam. What does he say? What about my offspring? <laughs> that was his response. What about my offspring? What about them? And Allah says, my promise is not to the evildoers. So even though the exam, he passed the grade, and he, was, he, was think he wasn't thinking about the immediate situation. He was thinking about the future. Allah tells him, my response is not to the ones that do wrong, not to the oppressors. So for me, the big takeaway for this is, as long as we stay true to the covenant, and as long as we don't become the oppressor, then we can stay true to the covenant of our father Ibrahim. That's what this leadership represents. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. The next individual I'd like to bring before you is from Baltimore, Maryland, raised there a second generation into a family who joined the nation in 1971 at Temple Number 6. He served as assistant to Imam Earl Abdul Malik Muhammad from 1998 until 2002, a graduate of Morgan State University with a Bachelor's of Science degree in bio biology. He taught at the Sister Clara Muhammad schools. I would like to bring before you the Imam Frank Shaheed of Baltimore, Maryland.
Assalamu alaikum. We begin with the law's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. <clears throat> we thank Allah for such a beautiful day today. Um, just the weather itself in the second annual um, uh, Muslim American Leadership Day, I'm sorry. Second annual Muslim American Leadership Day. Uh, this is a wonderful day for us as a community, as a people for humanity itself. So today for us, October 30th, it represents a birth, a new birth. And not just a birth of an individual, but as a birth of a new creation of man. Um, from the time our first father existed in this environment, we were always looking for completion of the soul, completion of community life, community life example, community life fulfillment from our father Abraham. Uh, first father, uh, alayhi salam, on him be peace. And we see that line of struggle from him all the way to his completed of Muhammad the prophet, may the prayers and the peace be upon him. We saw that line of struggle in man's creation to want to have the fullest expression of life. And Allah revealed to Muhammad the prophet that community life is the greatest expression of your humanity, community life. <clears throat> so we stand upon that community life. That's our stand. If there is no community, then we can't stand. Although in the Quran, it tells us to stand, to stand, to stand up, to be upright, to be righteous, to be upright. But how do we see that picture of us being upright and standing? We see the fulfillment of that in community. So we have a beginning to stand and an ending to stand for an example for all of humanity. So Muhammad the prophet lives forever. He lives forever in this standing, in this community establishment. So as I said, today is a new birth. And we know that our leader, Imam W.D. Muhammad, was born on this day, October 30th. So we recognize his special contribution, but we can't see him outside of the line of, a line of leadership that came prior to him. Um, in this situation of America, where a unique group of people were under some unusual circumstances that suppressed their humanity to the point where it completely eliminated it, which was against what Allah had created his, cre his creature for. So do we think that Allah would leave us, his creation, with no guidance? No. The Quran reminds us of that. He never leaves us without guidance, so he continuously gives, in his time, guidance for man to establish himself and to establish himself for what? To first recognize his own humanity, but secondly, second of all, to have his, his humanity be demonstrated in community. That's where it's respected. That's the goal. That's the goal of man. So Imam Muhammad came to us for this particular goal. Now, when we think of birth, we think of life, we think of existence, we think of expression, but we never ever think of it, that expression ever leaving. That expression should live forever. So we continuously have this rebirth, rebirthing of this same effort in man and his own, in his own nature to establish himself in community. So as one of the imams once said before, we were blessed to live in the time of, of, the time of Imam W.D. Muhammad, coming to the fulfillment of what community life should look like for us. So if we were blessed to have that, shouldn't it be right that our children also have that same expression? Shouldn't it be right that their children have that same expression? It absolutely should. So how do we give them that expression? Through community. Community life. It's not enough for us just to be Muslims and say we're Muslims. That doesn't qualify you. Community qualifies you. On the day of judgment, we stand and we stand in ranks. The ranks represent a line of community. That's our stance. So we were blessed to have such a wonderful leadership come in our midst and in our time. And Allah has blessed us all to come to understand that that leadership lives, that succession lives, and it lives through our leader, Imam Earl Abdul Malik Muhammad. So let's be joyful on this day because of this birth that we have. Let's be thankful in that birth and let's acknowledge that birth. And in that birth, we stand and we work toward the best of community life. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.
brothers and sisters, yesterday afternoon, we had a cultural affair, the New Africa Cultural Affair and Business Expo. And at that time, we honored some individuals for their excellence in community work. We had a couple of individuals who were not able to receive their presentations. So today, we would like to honor them. And I would like to call before you Imam Mubin. Assalamu alaikum. Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. Uh, at this point, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, our team members, those who uh, work with us here in the Newark area to bring this about and continue to work with uh, our efforts to continue the movement and direction that we're going and clear guidance. And uh, in that effort, uh, we have certain outstanding people working with us in Newark. And uh, uh, I have to, you know, I don't like to single out any individual, but sometimes an individual stands out and it's recognized by everyone. And uh, what I'm saying is that uh, I wanna, as the uh, head of our team, I want to uh, introduce someone who will further bring about uh, an introduction of who I'm talking about. Uh, uh, Brother Rashid, will you come forward? I want you to uh, offer this award on behalf of uh, our team. Uh, I have it. Okay. Uh, this is just a small token of our appreciation for uh, Sister Robin. Uh, we've been really the glue to hold us brothers together, okay? And uh, we just want to say thank you. And will you come up and thank you. Assalamu alaikum. With the law's name, merciful benefactor, merciful redeemer. I really don't care for this. I'm just a worker in the background, but I, Allah always moved me up front. If you have talent in certain things, you have no choice. If you see things have to be done, you have to do it. So I feel obligated, um, whatever I do, if I see I have the time and I enjoy it, and I did enjoy this journey. It was a nice journey. It was very interesting. I, I like them to read it. <laughs> you know, and sometimes that wasn't happening. But they, we had a beautiful team, beautiful team. Um, of course, Brother Elijah, got to know him. I've seen him in the community a lot of times. I knew Rubin and uh, Daryl, you know, for years. And also another brother, Calvin, for, for support. Uh, you know, he was, he was there in spirit and support. Um, but anyway, um, I'm more of a worker. So, um, you know, it's really hard for me to really um, be recognized because everything is for the pleasure of Allah. Whatever I do is for the pleasure of Allah. And I do highly respect uh, Imam Abdul Malik uh, Muhammad. You know, I started out his Islamic study class and when Mubeen stepped up, um, Imam Mubeen, when he stepped up, I felt obligated to help. Because um, I am from Newark, and I am retired now. Retired from an outside job. I still have a home-based business that, that I work on, or I try to work on, try to help my husband with. But anyway, I'm really more of a writer than a talker, but I can talk if I need to. <laughs> But anyway, thank you very, very much. And uh, I pray that uh, we continue this great work that we're doing and that we let nothing stop us. We cannot stop now. I mean.
I'm just the, uh, the helpmate. Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, with Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. Uh, as Sister Laurie said yesterday, we had a beautiful gathering uh, for our New Africa Cultural Fair. And one of the things that we were able to do was to honor on behalf of the, of the in action. And two of those, for those of you who were not with us yesterday, two of those honorees were Sister Zaima Abdullah and Sister Hassana Shah. And Sister Zaima, for those of us who are not familiar with her work here in the area, she's a sister who has worked tirelessly, tirelessly for over four decades here in the area. She established a homeless shelter for women. She uh, has run for civic office. She worked with the Department of Corrections. And she has lived an exemplary life as a Muslim businesswoman who was uh, very much inspired by her mother to do the work that she does. And Sister Hassana Shaw, who is an, ed uh, an educator par excellence that we would like to, to give. And I will bring up Imam Ibrahim to announce that. Thank you. Praise be to Allah. as alaykum. So this next awardee, um, I have gotten to know her parents quite well. Uh, Imam Rafiq and Sister Sakina. Um, and uh, I, she often uh, reminds me of myself at that age. Um, seeing, and she has, it's nothing that she has expressed explicitly, but I can see it in uh, her face. I can see it, sense it in her spirit. The same feeling that I had as a young person coming into adulthood and understanding and appreciating the importance of the work that is necessary to establish our people as a community. She is preparing to enter into college, um, I believe, uh, aeronautical engineering, uh, aerospace engineering. Um, <laughs> and uh, I believe uh, she's going to be a, a very bright star and a very important leader for the future of our people in America uh, and uh, through time, wherever, wherever we may be. Um, so we also have a little um, scholarship that the ministry would like to present her with. Um, so with that, I'll ask that uh, Sister Nadia Muhammad uh, step forward. And uh, we want to show our appreciation uh, for the promise that you've shown. <laughs> so we just like to present this award. It's the Award of Excellence presented to Nadia Haria Thornton on the occasion of Muslim American Leadership Day in recognition of your scholastic achievement and moral leadership. Oh, uh, I, I just, um, alaikum. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you to uh, everybody here. I did not know that this was going to be happening, but um, thank you all for the support. And I love being a part of this community. I love being Muslim and, and being a representation for, for younger people. I know that my mission is to be a leader in my own distinct way, even if I'm not like speaking or being up front like this, because it's comfortable. But um, <laughs> but I want to I want to change the world in my own unique way, and and I want to keep at it. And your support and your kindness and your words mean so much to me. And I I will not let you or myself or Allah down. So thank you thank for that. You. Methodist University, where she earned a degree in business administration and accounting and finance. She is a song, she's a songstress. She presented yesterday very beautifully, and she is a supporter of the work and leadership of Imam Earl Abdul Malik Muhammad. I would like to bring before you Sister Iman Rashida. As-salamu alaykum. 
Okay. You know, I, I want to uh, thank Almighty God Allah, the most merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. I bear witness that, that Allah, Almighty God Allah, is the one God, the creator of all things who we worship. And I bear witness that Muhammad the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, prayers and peace be upon him, is his last slave servant and messenger. I'm thankful for all of you and for all of the work that everyone here has done to provide us with an opportunity to continue to move this work forward as we are obligated to do, as Sister Robin said. When Sister Laurie asked me about speaking, I said, I'm not a speaker. But what came to my mind was a poem that Allah had given me in 2013 that was, it's a poem in honor and gratitude of Imam W.B. Muhammad for his legacy, his sacrifice, and contributions to our lives. And so I said, she said, you have five minutes. I said, let me time this. And it was five minutes. And I said, hmm, I guess I'm supposed to share this because I believe that many of us will feel the same way. I completed it after, of course, us um, learning of our role now to continue the work. And it begins. Allah has shown his favor on us granted us this life and blessing, restored our true selves to master with knowledge of Allah we were missing. A father and mother conceived this child, nurtured him by Allah's design. They gave us the start of a new day, Allah's restoration, his purpose aligned. When the world has thrown in the towel, said they are doomed to fail. Thought we would never amount to much, but dope, prostitution, and jail. Put a plan in place to completely annihilate, to erase the evidence of many hates that were perpetrated on a whole people with a plan to build on their backs the United States. Masterfully engineering the water and food to destroy all signs of their lives. Turning their own children against them, working 24-7 to contrive. Making nonsense seem like good sense, putting traps all over in their path. Believing that Allah's power was not great enough, spreading rumors of them as if we should fear their wrath. O oh Allah, but one day only you knew your plan would empower our soul to lift up and rise to a new mind free of the villain's deceit and goal. You would bring forth a new birth, one who had no fear nor grief. He'd know within all fiber of his being that the answer was La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. It was the belief. The belief that would free a people who by now could have been extinct, intoxicated with poor body, mind, and spirit, left to die in the streets of defeat. Your love for us, Allah is sure, or we would not know our own names. Stolen hundreds of years ago, trapped with physical, then mental and spiritual chains. We cannot complete this journey without you as our constant guide. There are so many booby traps, those we even make are far and wide. Please accept our prayers in humble submission. Your servant we must honor with appreciation for his sacrifices you blessed us to live and garner. Let us continue the fight for our best in life. Let us not give up on the mission. You chose us to hold the duty, to uphold the flag of submission. Bless us with the dignity 
Bless him with the dignity he deserves. Grow our faith and work in altitude. For the work he did to please you, Allah, let our lives reflect our gratitude. It's time to purge any hate of self, the baggage that allowed our defeat. We must know when it raised of freedom, justice, and equality. We cannot stop now this race we can run. For self and others, purge, take time to release all hatred. For self and others, purge even with tears. Our signs show that Allah is with us. We must win and master our fears. Allah says he never leaves a people without guidance. Do you believe Allah's promise is sure? As Imam W.D. Muhammad brought our people to understand true Islam, his emphasis would surely endure. Courageous believers, we must continue to run as steeds of war in this race against ignorance and fear of criticizers, staying open to truth and right. In this troubled world, continuing its full attacks on our families and children, Imam Earl Abdul Malik Muhammad was specially prepared by our leader for this fight. I love you with you all. The next, the next gentleman that I'm going to bring before you is hails from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He's a secondary school educator teaching ancient civilization or ancient history. I want to bring before you now Imam Duhan Abdella. Praise be to Allah, we always begin with a spirit of gratitude. The Muslim is always grateful. Uh, regardless of what's going on, we're, we're grateful. We're grateful that things are going right, and we're grateful that things didn't go <laughs> worse than they did. Always grateful. We thank Allah uh, for his role in protecting us, in watching over us, in guarding us, nurturing us, uh, and developing us upon our potential and moving us in the direction of our, our destiny. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, believers. Um, Allah, we witness that he is one, and we witness that Muhammad, to whom the Quran was revealed, is his servant, his slave servant and messenger. We pray that the prayers and the peace be on him, his family, the companions, the righteous, all, and what follows. Um, to some of the things that I had been thinking about. He mentioned uh, Prophet Abraham and the covenant that uh, the covenant that Abraham had, the covenant that, that was established with him and that was the inheritance that I heard it, and those those following those following his leadership. Uh, in the Quran, uh, Muhammad the Prophet is described as following the way of Abraham. And this ties into what I wanted to really mention because it also says in the Quran, it also describes about two orientations that Muhammad the prophet had. And I'll, I'll try to tie these in as quickly as I can. Uh, when Muhammad the prophet first started his mission, uh, he directed his following in the direction of uh, Jerusalem, the, the sacred mosque in, in Jerusalem. Uh, and that was a direction that they oriented their life. And then through the course of events, as events unfolded, Allah ended up revealing to him, uh, because he was not satisfied with that direction, Allah gave him another direction that he moved in. The direction that he ended up uh, uh, turning his followers towards to orient their life was the Kaaba, the Kaaba, the sacred house that was built by Abraham. It was built by Abraham and represents uh, what Abraham was pointing us to. So, when I look at when I look at this in the context of our life and in the context of just life in general and faith. Uh, 
every people has a natural orientation. Well, let me say this. Let me say this. There's a verse in the Quran that says, Allah asked the question. He, he asked, do you think you'll enter the garden without facing the trials that challenged the people who came before you? And us as followers of Muhammad the Prophet, we can expect that uh, the trials that Muhammad the Prophet faced will endure those same trials as well if we're following him sincerely. So the, when it comes to the establishment of a people, and we're here at Muslim American Leadership Day as a, as a new people, when it comes to the establishment of a people, every people has their original orientation that they turn to. Their original orientation is, uh, is uh, them standing upon their dignity as a distinct group of people reaching for their excellence, coming from their circumstances and their experiences. Uh, and when they establish themselves as a dignified people, the way to advance beyond that is to embrace the guidance of God and move, move their, their particular uh, identity and their particular expression as a people and move that and focus that in the direction of universality. And that's the second, that's the second orientation. That's the second Kibla. Uh, anybody who wants us to skip over uh, orienting our life upon our own individual experiences is somebody who wants to make us uh, a slave to their to the interests of their people, just like every people, just like uh, uh, every people has a, a right and entitlement to establish themselves. So do we, and so we are establishing ourselves as a people. We're establishing our dignity, and with that dignity and with that identity, uh, we're moving towards the destiny that Allah has set out for all people: the, the destiny of, of universality. Peace. Assalamu alaikum. We thank Imam Duhan Abdullah for those insightful words. Next, we'd like to bring up before you our sister, Sister Farada Abdul Tawab. She is a servant of God, wife, and mother of four daughters residing in Columbia, Maryland. As lead researcher and educational consultant with Building the Right Foundation, Farada conducts research in Quran based educational philosophy and methodology, family, school, partnerships, and new school development. Farada is a home educator facilitating holistic, character-focused education for her children. She has taught at the middle school level at the Claire Muhammad School of Washington, D.C., and at the Baltimore Claire Muhammad School. Farada was raised in a family of educators committed to community life, and her life pursuits reflects this. She believes that education and investment in youth is a high priority. She began and completed her elementary education at the Sister Claire Muhammad School in Boston, Massachusetts, where her identity as a believer was nurtured. She is a lifelong learner and longtime student of Imam W.D. Muhammad. I bring before you our sister, Sister Farida. Okay, <laughs> uh, with 1,800 years ago, in the hills overlooking the city of Mecca, a chosen man retreated to a cave called Hira. His was a soul deeply troubled by the dark state of ignorance in which his people were steeped. Every fiber of his being ached with concern for the rampant immorality, abuse, and oppression visited upon them as a result of their broken covenant with God. His concerns were addressed by the creator of the universe when he sent his angel with the redemptive solution for this troubled people. Indeed, for all of mankind. Read in the name of your guardian evolver, who created, created mankind from a clot adhering. Read and your guardian evolver is most generous. He taught by use of the pen, taught mankind that which he did not know. More than a thousand years later, in 1894, on the occasion of the dedication of a school for African Americans in Manassas, Virginia, and on the 56th anniversary of his escape from bondage, another man rose to address the esteemed crowd. 
His was the mighty voice of a statesman, advisor to US presidents, a man whose purpose and promise were secured by his faith in God while yet shackled by the bonds of chattel slavery. In the dark days of post-Reconstruction America, when the hopes of emancipation gave way to the terror and gloom of lynchings and second-class citizenship, he exhorted the young students there to accept the inspiration of hope, to recognize education as emancipation, as the uplifting of the soul of man into the glorious light of truth, the light only by which men can be free, and without which humanity can neither honor themselves nor their creator. 37 years after that, as populations the world over struggled under the weight of the Great Depression, and as a newly formed people continued their arduous climb up from slavery and out of oppression, a woman small in stature but imbued with a mighty spirit planted herself firmly in the doorway of her home in Detroit, Michigan. Placing her life on the line, she honored her creator, standing as a bulwark against those who would deprive her children of the rights to an education that liberated the minds and souls for generations to come. She stood that day between her children and those representing the full weight of governmental authority. She stands in American history as the vanguard of the parental and community movement to take responsibility for the moral and intellectual life of the society through independent education. Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, may the prayers and peace of God be upon him, Frederick Douglass, and Clara Muhammad. One was a messenger of God, the final prophet sent to mankind. One was an abolitionist and statesman, calling a nation to fulfill its covenant with God by securing the rights of all of its people. And one was a mother, a wife, and a steward of community life, birthing possibilities and nurturing excellence for generations of Muslim Americans. All were guided by God through revelation and through the book of nature to the realization that education exists to liberate humanity. Education is not for the liberation of the individual alone. Indeed, if it serves its purpose well, a good education cultivates in the individual the skills and knowledge needed to serve the life of the community, as our sister Nadia so eloquently uh, laid out for us earlier this afternoon. And I've been told that I have about 30 seconds to wrap up, so I'm not going to be able to deliver the, the entirety of this speech. But I'll leave you with this. Uh, we're in need of a renaissance. Uh, at the time of his death in 1974, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, under uh, his leadership, there were 47 institutions, the Muhammad University of Islam, that were in existence. And during the lifetime of leadership of the Imam Warfuddin Muhammad, there were 75 such institutions renamed the Clara Muhammad Schools uh, across this nation. The current state of our educational landscape reflects the state of our community life. Where once we had dozens of schools in cities across the nation, there now exist 10 to 14 full and part-time institutions in the Clara Muhammad Schools network. Sisters and brothers, we are in need of a renaissance. Just as education by the Quran lifted the Arabs out of ignorance and led to the flowering of an interreligious and global intellectual movement that fostered the period of enlightenment, so too must Muslim Americans go to the Quran to create a renaissance in the lives of the African American people, Bilalian people, all Americans, indeed our entire human family. Using the Quranic paradigm of education that liberates, education based on the universal principles found in scripture and inspired by the bounty and signs of creation, we can and must return to the imperative established in the first revelation to Muhammad the prophet, peace be upon him. We are living in a moment in time described by our imam and teacher, Imam Warathuddin Muhammad, as the day of religion. At once precarious and full of promise, it is a time when truth stands out clearly from falsehood. 
It is a time when the clarity of the message must drive us to embrace the fierce urgency of now. This is our time, believers. This is our time to march forth, whether light or heavy, and strive in the way of God with your belongings and your lives. That is best for you if you only knew it. It is time for each of us to spend our money, our time, our expertise on the establishment, support, and rebirth of our educational institutions. If a generation just out of slavery could establish and sustain schools, then we too, with sincere hearts, equipped with literacy and the Quranic insight of Imam Waratuddin Muhammad, are heavy with resources to sustain educational institutions that will liberate and sustain community life for generations to come. For without them, community life will not die. We thank Sister Farada for those profound words. And we thank Allah that she is with us. Praise be to Allah. My next introduction is our professor, Professor Wally Shabazz. The professor commands an audience with his straight talk. He is a living historian of not only the history of the nation of Islam, but also the life and circumstances of the so-called black man in the wilderness of North America. We are in for a treat. Our professor, Professor Wally Shabazz. With the lost name, the merciful <clears throat> benefactor, the merciful redeemer, all praise are due to Allah, the guardian evolver and sustainer of the heavens and the earth. Sister Farida, you <laughs> make it hard on an old man. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Anthropologists have come to the conclusion that there have been 80,000 in the history of man studying ancient artifacts, paintings on the walls, uh, script that man has been searching for his Lord. And there have been 80,000 iterations of that expression in the history of mankind. And Allah tells us that he is ever evolving his creation. Here we are in Newark, New Jersey, a people who were left empty, designed by the slave master bringing us from Africa, who many of us were Muslims in Africa were brought here, emptied out, and filled with what he wanted to fill us with. He had a 250-year free reign in destroying our humanity. We were unnatural. We were self-haters. There was no evolution from the environment speaking to man in reference to his natural evolution. We lost that. Rafiq, if, if a family as beautiful as yours was seen on the plantation, your children would have been split up, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia. Your wife would be sent to Maryland. You'd be sent to Florida. Break that tribe up because there's dignity in the face and they have a vision. That was evolution took place for and with the so-called American Negro. Everyone that came to America utilized our innocence to benefit themselves. You think that has do you think that's changed in 2022 when we are Muslims? You don't think there are people who want to benefit from our experience, from our innocence, so that they can improve their lives on top of ours? That's why this is so important. That's right. 
maintaining our cultural integrity, maintaining that from which we came from, and have faith in Allah that he can bless us like he blessed the Malaysians, that he can bless us like he blessed the Saudis, that he can bless us like he blessed the Palestinians. He is Rabi al The whole package belongs to Allah. So why do we have to go someplace else when our condition is worse than everyone else's? And if he is the Lord of all systems of knowledge, he can certainly resurrect the dead, mentally dead, in the wilds of North America. So the presenters before me all spoke in a cultural line with dignity, recognizing our leader, Muhammad the prophet, prayers and peace be upon the prophet, and a line of excellence in leadership. You think you can go someplace else in the Muslim world and bring up someone outside of that leadership from amongst those people as, your lead, as their leader? You wouldn't last there 20 minutes. We should fight with every fiber within us to maintain this tradition. No doubt, the strategy in America, the psychology in America, is for us to have doubt in our own inherent worth and in our own inherent individual leadership. That's the strategy. So if the pitcher, Rafiq, I'm going to use a baseball analogy. The pitcher throws 98 mile an hour heaters. And you hesitate, you're going to strike out. You got to know a fastball is coming and swing the bat if you want to hit a home run. Imam Earl Abdul Malik Muhammad does not hesitate to hit home runs. Every time he swings the bat, he hits a home run. Look here. <clears throat> We in Newark, New Jersey. Minister James Shabazz in the Nation of Islam in Newark, New Jersey, the mayor of this city, Mayor Adonisio, wanted to have a debate with Minister James Shabazz. This is our history. Minister James Shabazz said, debate, let's go. He defeated the mayor of the city of Newark in a debate with that teaching. In Elizabeth, New Jersey, the FOI was challenged by the um, uh, National Guard to, ha to have a um, drill team contest. The FOI destroyed the National Guard. That's the history of Newark, New Jersey. The men had a special role and an obligation in our history. Men talked to men. Men didn't text men. Men didn't tweet men. Men didn't talk about men on a, on a uh, platform. You had a beef with a man. You spoke to that man yourself. The captain spoke to that man. When I got put out the temple, 1972, when I came back, I had to stand first in front of the investigator and tell the investigator my role as a, as, a, as a fruit of Islam. Then I had to stand before 400 men. And they were asked, should we take Brother Kenneth back? I had to stand like a man like this in front of 400 men and defend myself. That's what men do. They don't tweet, they don't backbite, they don't slander. Men talk to men. So all of these innuendos and petty conversations about nothing have nothing to do with the insight of Imam Earl Abdul Malik Muhammad's expression of the leadership of Imam W.D. Muhammad and this progression. Let's stay here. The Republicans got one convention. The Democrats got one convention. We had one convention for 
almost 90 years. Now we got two. The sister expressed how our schools, of our future is destroyed. What's the leadership that'll bring us back to the dignity that we once had as a community of people? This is the leadership. That's right. Come together as in a race for all that is good. This is the best. This man was producing this in the institution. He was locked up and had interviews. Hear me nice on this one. He had interviews in prison speaking about our condition and the condition of the community and an Islamic perspective from the penitentiary that sounded like it was on CBS. No local uh, presentation. We are a community of people from coast to coast. The most powerful nation in the annals of human history, and we say leadership is local. We need unity, we need direction, we need guidance, we need wisdom. So any man that has a problem with this man, talk to him in his face. That's what men do. So the challenge for us is to maintain our direction, maintain our dignity, Stay on the course and support our leader. I salam alaykum. We thank our professor for those words that he just shared with us. This is the tradition that we are from, a tradition of straight talk, real. The next presenter I'd like to bring before you is my friend and brother, Imam Ibrahim El Amin. He is the special assistant and partner of the successor of Imam W.D. Muhammad, Imam Earl Abdul Malik Muhammad. I can't think of another person who could fulfill the role he has qualified for. I bring before you Imam Ibrahim El Amin. Praise be to Allah. We witness that Allah alone is worthy of our worship, and we witness that Muhammad, the prophet, is his messenger and slave servant. We greet you with the greetings of peace, the universal greetings of peace, the greetings of Muslims. Assalam alaikum. Uh, Professor Shabazz remarked that Sister Farah made it difficult for him. I see he's returned the favor to me. <laughs> Praise be to Allah. The, as was stated earlier, uh, the Muslim American Leadership Day on this day, October 30th, which is the birthday of Imam W.D. Muhammad, is not so much a recognition of the birth of the individual, um, but really the birth of a whole people. In recognizing him, in uh, recognizing his commitment and his determination, uh, we recognize the best in ourselves, and we recognize the best in humanity. Uh, behind me is a, um, a banner that we put together. And as Professor Shabazz was speaking, some, those of you who are here today and may have some familiarity with us um, in terms of other programs that we've had. And in each and every progression of these photos and the relationship or relationships between the men depicted in these photos, uh, spell out something very special and very important. Uh, Imam W.D. Muhammad once described his father as the special creation of uh, Professor Farad Muhammad. And we know that in uh, the family of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Imam W.D. Muhammad was recognized even before his birth as the special son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So I don't want to extend my comments further than is necessary, but I wish to bring before you the special student of Imam W.D. Muhammad, Imam Earl Abdul Malik Muhammad.
Praise be to Allah. Let's praise be to God. We greet you as Muslims greet each other. Assalam alaikum. Let us peace be on you. We are thankful to God for this occasion in this special place, a great city that has such a interesting name. We can't uh, set aside thinking carefully on that name, Newark. Newark, as it's, as it's pronounced by the natives of this city, uh, but we can't set aside the importance of that. Uh, let that wash over us in consideration. Newark, <clears throat> very special place, and we are thankful to God to be here and to be the to be hosted by uh, some very hardworking and sincere believers in God who are courageous people to stand with me, with us, uh, and to think of us in the way that they do, to think of us as representatives and uh, persons living for a tradition of excellence, a tradition of excellence in leadership, uh, and a tradition of excellence in service to mankind and to the African American people and to America as well. Uh, very courageous people who are part formed themselves into a committee to host this Muslim American Leadership Day program. And um, uh, I can't say that I met, met any of them prior to uh, them making themselves aware, making themselves known to me, making me aware of them uh, and their support of me. I can't say that I had met them in the years that I was Imam W.D. Muhammad's assistant and representative. I uh, can't say that I met them personally, but I'm sure we met in our spirit uh, that they are individually and also as a group uh, strong contributors to that which has made Newark such a special place in the history of our community. I am indebted to them, and I thank God for them. Maybe the majority of the believers in Newark can't see it now, and uh, because of circumstances that have developed in the last maybe 15 years or so have been separated from what is the real important strain of life that works in our spirit to establish us for God's purpose. I know that we might think of ourselves as having a Muslim identity and that's enough to say that we have Islamic identity or Muslim identity. But the Muslim life, as I heard one of the uh, presenters say today, the Muslim life must be established in all meaningful needs and expressions. It's not enough that it live as an identity for us. 
but it has to be brought into establishment, establishment, into life, into reality, into the material existence. Uh, leadership in religion is worthless if it doesn't invite our minds and hearts to bond with this material life, material creation, material reality. There is no reality for our spirit in this existence, except that we have a relationship with the material world. So it's not enough for us to dream of an Islamic identity. We have to live for the reality of that. And in symbol, I heard Professor Shabazz, he said that in his study of uh, the anthropologist, that he said that they found 80,000. This is the first time I heard him say this. And we talk often. He never mentioned it to me. Uh, he said that they found 80,000 expressions of interest on the part of peoples to find their Lord, Creator. I believe that number is a symbol. Hmm. Eight. Eight. And what is the meaning of eight? And I'm going to talk about it today. What is the meaning of it? But I can give you a hint. Muhammad is the eighth. You might have a limited knowledge of Prophet Muhammad, the prayers and the peace be on him, and we witness that he is God's servant and last prophet, as we also witness to God's oneness and that he is the Lord and creator of everything that exists. And he is the creator of human intelligence. Human intelligence. And he created our lives to grow into the best possible expression of human intelligence and the merciful Redeemer. So the Christians, they say that God is a Savior, and that <coughs> have you been introduced to your Savior, your personal Savior? Well, do you know that Muslims should know that too? Muslims should know that God is our Savior? That is Islamic teaching. Allah says in the Quran that he is the protecting friend. The protecting friend. So that's not just belonging to Christians as an, as an understanding. Yes, the praise is for God. And we are here to celebrate, and by celebrating I mean acknowledge its importance in, 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 in an extraordinary way. Not in any ordinary way, but in an extraordinary way. We're here to acknowledge the birth of Imam W. Dean Muhammad. Uh, and the way that we are celebrating that is by saying to the world that we belong to a Muslim American tradition of leadership. I think that he would be pleased with that. He would be accepting of that. He wouldn't feel comfortable that we would be identifying his birthday as something very special if we would just focus upon him as an individual. He would be very happy 
I believe if he knew that we were focusing upon his birthday as a commemoration and also a opportunity to commit and recommit ourselves publicly to a tradition of leadership excellence. Uh, beginning with the influence of his father's teacher, Mr. W.D. Farad. And you see this banner here behind us and uh, these great giants, giants. And I hope that when I am finished with this address today, that you, for that awakening that still, even up till now, 2022, <clears throat> is an absolute need in the life of a people that are still accepting, generally speaking, to be carried around as if babies in the arms of their mother. Hmm. So how can you say that? We have all kinds of achievers and people of excellence and wealth and influence and power. Yeah, we do. We have individuals who have achieved. But the overwhelming numbers of us still look to outside circumstances, outside of our reach and influence, outside of our wealth, outside of our uh, systems of education to carry responsibility for our life, to plan our life, to protect our life. That is the condition of the overwhelming numbers, the majority. And the leaders <clears throat> don't seem to be sensitive to the need to address this condition and seem to be satisfied that uh, we accept that as our perpetual lot or existence. Well. I belong, and these men and women belong to a tradition that doesn't accept that. We don't accept that. We only accept that which God has commanded in the nature of his human creation. He commanded it orchestrated and commanded it God says that we're to be brought out of a condition of ignorance and darkness and then says we are commanded by virtue of that movement to foster and to promote the highest existence, the highest standards of existence, the highest appreciation for human excellence, that we are commanded to do this. This is a part of our existence. We can't excuse ourselves from the responsibility. We have to live for it, stand for it, not make excuses for falling short of it even if we are unpopular, even if we are unpopular. It makes no difference to me in this time, in this moment, if all these seats in this audience here are filled or not, because I know that in time they will be. And it will be so, so much of an important message that resonates in the life of our people, you won't be able to get into the room you have to make reservation months and months in advance. Mm -hmm. That's coming. That's coming. All these empty seats right here, these are empty seats in the, in the, in the uh, ark <coughs> to paradise, mm -hmm. to the promised land. <laughs> I know somebody looking out there, they, they know that uh, if, if there's a man to captain that ship, 
it have to be somebody tied to Mr. W.D. Farad and Elijah Muhammad and Imam W.D. Muhammad and tied to those figures and their influence in our life and what that means and tied to that exclusively. And I'm that one. That's right. That's, that's my uh, designation. I, I was I was uh, imam of uh, Baltimore, Maryland. But even the, the the members of the congregation in Baltimore, they supported me as the imam of that masjid. But they didn't think of me only as the imam of that masjid. Their support of me and their strong support of me really had to do with what they understood to be my relationship with Imam W. D. Muhammad. That's what they, that's, that's what they uh, uh, supported and welcomed and loved and um, uh, knew that I would represent that to them. I never had a the mind that uh, I should just be focused upon serving the local <coughs> congregation. I never had that mind. Uh, if I had had that mind, then I, it would have been satisfactory for me to lead the Friday prayers and never reach to Imam W.D. Muhammad to visit the city of Baltimore. But I wasn't satisfied with that. I had been sensitized not to be satisfied with that. And uh, I, I uh, actually came into conflict with leaders, other leaders in the community who were insistent that our message was not appealing enough to reach big audiences in the United States of America. They had settled on that. I would not settle on that. And a place like Baltimore that was not known to host such message in, in, uh, with a, a broad appeal, uh, we made plans to bring Imam W. Muhammad to Baltimore with the expectation that the assembly that gathered to hear him would be the largest one in the United States that year. That was in my mind, and that's what we accomplished. I don't know, maybe 4,000 or more. So that put those leaders to shame. Not that I had that as an intent. I didn't. I wanted them to be inspired to do the same thing in the cities where they were from. The same motivation that I had then, I have now. That our orientation is the reignition of a lifeline that was stolen warred upon, oppressed in the scheming against the innocent human soul that was unjustly taken from the African continent and brought here to be the slaves of men. That is not a local concern. <laughs> that is the concern of the universal self. So the, the uh, topic for this address today, community life success requires standing in the day of responsibility. Community life success requires standing in the day of responsibility. And the day of responsibility is the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. And the day of judgment is the day of religion, where how you perform before God with your inherent intelligence is measured, is 
considered that you can't escape in this day. The responsibility to hold up your part in the relationship of the covenant. The covenant is a relationship. It's a statement of trust between the Lord creator and the intelligent creation. The creation that God made that was given the power to understand the nature of all things. God didn't give that responsibility and that understanding to any other creature except man, humans. So on the day of religion, you have to present yourself and to realizing the progress that you have made along the path of your destiny the progress that you have made along the path of your purpose. The steps that you have made in light of man's progress on this earth, in light of unbelievable steps of achievement in technology, new perceptions about our own reality on this earth and the reality of the possibility of intelligent life in other places of this material universe. Mm -hmm. Still, you have the responsibility to present yourself and what you have accomplished. The light is on all communities of man and you can't excuse yourself. Say, oh, well, I uh, belong to the people that were oppressed in the earth. That argument is given in the Quran, mm -hmm. in the holy book of Muslims, the word of God. And the answer comes that there, no matter what the situation for your oppression, are havens in the earth where you can establish yourself, even if that means in, your, in, in, your, in the privacy of your own intelligence. That's what it means. In the privacy of your own commitments. In the privacy of your own planning. Your own sense of self-worth. There is no physical haven. There is no physical support for your progress. But there is support in your soul. And you first created a soul. Before, before this, in this, you were a soul. Before you had a material reality. All this took place before you had a material reality. Before you were mission language. It's a language environment, a language situation that challenges us. It's intended to challenge us. It's intended to challenge the race the African American people. The only Elijah Muhammad's leadership, his language was a challenge to stand up in spite of mm -hmm. whatever the circumstances are that you're dealing with. You have the same morality and inherent innate morality that you have to act upon. You know that this was uh, uh, a part of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's message? Yes. When he said, some of this earth or else. Some of this earth or else. That was a challenge to the African American people to progress upon the intelligence and commitments of your inherent soul. That no matter what powers oppose you, that you have within you, innately, inherently, 
an energy that will work for you if you just engage it. Mm -hmm. impressive sight. These men standing here with me, us standing together, and there are others of you out there, you should be standing with me too, but if you all stand with me today, nobody in the audience is going to talk to you, I have to turn around and talk to you. So I appreciate, but I know that you all who are sitting are standing too, at least the majority of you all that I'm looking at right now if not the majority of the persons who are watching us. There is an existence that is referred to in scripture and referred to in the expressions of the poets and the thinkers and the philosophers. It is the promised land. The promised land. Our eloquent civil rights uh, leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., he spoke on his understanding of the promised land, that he had a picture in his mind of what that is. He even said that he could see it. And he spoke of it as he said, I've seen, I've seen in the, in the past tense, he said, I've seen the promised land. And he said, now he's speaking, uh, I believe as an inspired person following the reasoning in the Bible of Moses. And he's saying that he's seen the promised land and he said, I may not uh, get there with you, but we as a people will get there. That's what he said. He said, I've seen it, meaning that he had experienced it. And I can tell you that if he had seen it and he experienced it, then he certainly wasn't talking about some kind of political freedom. He wasn't talking about uh, the ambitions of the civil rights movement to get voting rights, or even to get citizenship rights. That wasn't the ultimate interest or the ultimate goal. We live in these United States of America, 2022, and even now, where it's not a question, or the question can't be raised that we're not entitled to certain citizenship recognitions, that still the majority of people in these United States of America would like to see us as a group set aside from them. that they prefer us to be to ourselves and them to, their selves, to themselves. They prefer us to be in our areas of the cities and they be in their area of the city. That's a reality, whether you want to accept it or not. And I think too many of us Uh, 
uh, blinders on as if, as if that's not the reality. That reality should not be disturbing to us. That reality should be something we embrace. We should embrace the spirit to plan and to have uh, aspirations for a social destiny that we are responsible for ourselves. We should thank God for circumstances that support that in us, in America. Social circumstances. Do you know, do you, do you recognize that the attack on the capital of the United States of America is to be understood as really an attack on not government authority, but an attack on the social destiny of man, an attack on America as one that wants to guarantee and support opportunity for people to have their life in freedom independently and in with an But I am. Government is nothing more than, if you understand it from the influence of sacred scripture and the revelation of God to support man's nature. Government is nothing more than the management of community. That's what it is. And community is the whole package. Community existence, community responsibility, acknowledging community obligations, living with a community spirit, managing the life of community is the promised land. So what we witnessed, all of us witnessed as American citizens on the attack on our capital, is an attack on that movement in the spirit of man. And I believe that these uh, persons who are uh, caring deeply for the future of America read the possibility of that happening, and that's why they sped up the time for me to be released from prison. Say, well, you all, you, you exaggerating, man. <laughs> You're not that important. You can believe that. You can believe that if you want. I may not be as an individual, but what I represent is. If there was someone speaking to these matters with the same clarity that I speak to them, then they would be the ones given that support. But it happened to be that I, my situation was that I was in prison. And I was speaking from prison with a sensitivity for those interests and those matters. And the people who were observing the movements in the culture saw that this influence needs to be free. They knew exactly what I would do, what I'm doing right now. And they knew that no, no small audience would stop me. No small or, or, or uh, uh, um, small concentrated support would stop me. Hmm. If there was nothing to support that vision and that message, I would still continue. When I was telling my family, while I was in prison, I'm going to, uh, it's necessary for me to write this, this book. My father, he said, how are you going to do that? How, how's that possible? <laughs> and I didn't have an answer for him. And I tell you, it was very difficult for me. In fact, when they found out, when the prison people found out that I was writing the book and they found out what the subject was, they put me in solitary confinement for 90 days and told me, said, well, uh, we have to investigate what you're doing. 
I didn't object. It just allowed me to finish it without all the interference. <laughs> I had a little, you see this pen here. You, on the inside of this pen is a little insert. And they wouldn't give that to you. They wouldn't give you a pen like this in solitary confinement. They give you this little insert. So I had to write the thing wow. by hand with that little insert. And I have this callus on my finger to remind me of that. That won't go away. That callus won't go away. So every time I look at it, I remember. Hmm. And you know what I wrote in, while I was in prison? While I was in the solitary confinement? The chapter I wrote? Chapter 8. Mm -hmm. Chapter 8. Eight is the promised land. Eight is the completion for the social order and social aspirations. Eight begins with the first, Adam, and grows out of Adam in all of these iterations of progress for man's life towards the social destiny. And the eighth is in man. It's in our life. It's intrinsic, innate, inherent. It must be revealed. It must come out. And it comes out as Muhammad the prophet, the walking Quran, mm -hmm. the leader for all times, in which all moral leadership is subsumed. And that's what is meant, that he's the last prophet, the messenger prophet in which the role of the message is completed. I hope you'll be patient with me. I know we got started a little late, but I hope you'll be patient with me. I think you'll find that what we're addressing is important and worth your patience. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't know that the people in Newark, that you're getting this message. Uh, you're getting it today. <laughs> but I don't know that you're getting it any other day on Friday or Sunday, or whenever the, the, the different the mosques they meet the, and the congregations meet. I don't know that you're getting this message. I don't think so. In fact, I doubt very seriously if this message is being gotten in any of these major cities of the United States of America uh, uh, in spite of the claim that they are following Imam W.D. Muhammad's leadership and that they have his language. I saw somewhere, somewhere recently, someone said, oh, there's plenty of people doing what he's doing. <laughs> and I read it myself. I said to myself, well, show me who they are, please. <laughs> please show me. I would like to join them. We think of leadership as being individual, singular. And that is true. But there are components in that singular or singularity. There are components that are necessary to function for the good function and role of leadership. God gives vision to individuals and he establishes them in their goodness. He establishes them in their moral decency. And by way of that as a venue or avenue he of leadership. Now, if we didn't have this occasion today, perhaps we wouldn't be sensitive to celebrate the importance of these important figures that are here on this wall behind me. I'm not satisfied that the followers 
of Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam are trusted with the representation of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his importance to us as a people. I'm not satisfied by that. I'm not satisfied that what he represents as a progression in our life is respected properly in their hands mm -hmm. only. Right. A whole part of the story of his importance would be lost and not spoken of if we weren't expressing this now. And I have heard persons in Newark, believe it or not, recently I heard someone, I won't say who, speaking of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I want to just I'm, just, I'm saying this to you all, and I want you to put it in the context of what we're talking about today. And uh, this person said, uh, well, I won't say all of what he said, but I'll, I'll just say this. He referred to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as Elijah. And he was referring to succession and leadership. He was talking about leadership. And he said Elijah didn't, didn't name a successor. He referred to him as Elijah. And you know, I thought to myself, and you might think this is a minor point, but this is not a minor point if you are following the uh, right. sacred nature of what has been revealed in our life as a people over generations. So I thought to myself, as I listened to this person, even Imam W.D. Muhammad never referred to his father as Elijah. He either said, my father, or Elijah Muhammad, or the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And most of the time, he said the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So even if a person claimed association with this history, they can lose an appreciation for what is most important in it and lose a connection where, with where it is supposed to take you. And it will be revealed to us in little small things. When they say of me, Earl, they call me Earl. They, they, they say it in a kind of a disrespectful, irreverent way. Or they'll say Earl Abdul Malik. And uh, some people say it and they, they're just being innocent and straight. But some, most of them that say it are trying to uh, separate me from Muhammad. That's what they're doing. I know that's what they're doing. They don't think I know it, but I do. What Muhammad they want to separate me from? Every important Muhammad. <laughs> <laughs> Muhammad the prophet and Imam W.D. Muhammad and his father. That's who they want to separate me from. They don't want to see that there is this continuation. They don't want you to recognize or appreciate the importance of this continuation, that it continue and that it succeed for its purpose, that we are not satisfied until we have the success. We have it. We see it. We taste it. We feel it. It's within our grasp. They don't, those who are, have, have, have uh, positioned themselves as adversaries don't want us to have that sensitivity. They don't want us, want us to have that focus on the importance of our life. Why? Because they belong to someone else's influence. Yes, they do. They belong to someone else's planning for our life. And whether you recognize it or not, they take from their language, they introduce that to us as if it were the life-saving language of Islam. And it is not. Let me tell you, if you come into an appreciation of the leadership that I represent and that in my expressions continue, and I say my expressions, but I'm not just talking about myself. I'm talking about every person that you heard speak today. If it were not for this determination that I had in myself to make this happen today and others be inspired by that, you wouldn't have heard from them today. There would have been no program for, them, for you to hear from them. That's what leadership is, and that's what they want to cancel. They want us to believe that 
uh, it's enough for us to have the Friday prayers. The Friday prayers are in heaven. It's our spiritual expression in this material existence. It is a symbol. But what we teach and what we represent must be represented and taught not just on Friday, but on every single day and every single hour and every single minute of every day and every breath. And really, our, 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 uh, uh, we are held to a ritual obligation on Fridays, a time obligation, and other expressions of that spirituality that are really, if we're understanding it properly, it's great uh, uh, measure of power in our life is symbolic. That's not the time. That's not the time for, for this kind of teaching that I'm giving you now. No, it's not. Some of these that, that uh, occupy that time and occupy those hours in our day are really working against and have adopted the strategy of the adversary of man. Hmm. Yes, I know that maybe some of you all can't appreciate what I'm saying right now because you have been locked into something. But if you will only step back and look at Imam W.D. Muhammad, you say he is your leader, look at him and ask yourself, how many times did we see him lead Jummah prayer in the year? Maybe three times in a year. But we saw him every week almost yes, speak from Homewood, Illinois. Now I'm being more familiar and I'm being more personal with this now. I'm giving you time, you know, cities and what have you. But this is also very important so we understand that certain things represent the heavenly existence for us. And other things represent material responsibility material obligations that we can't excuse ourselves from. <clears throat> so I have purposely chosen not to present this preaching or this teaching on Friday because that is not in our tradition. Yes, I am emphasizing it must be emphasized that these things are or are not a part of our tradition. And when it's all said and done, when the matter is concluded, you will find that in the future expressions of this tradition that I represent right now, that tradition will, be, will have been more of a factor to bring people to appreciate Islam and to bring people closer to their created dignity and to bring people closer to an appreciation for their Lord Creator than anything that has been expressed about Islam since the time of Prophet Muhammad and his companions. I'm telling you, in time. I know they say about us, they say, you know, that we don't have any real scholarship in our community that there really is no expression of really what Islam is in the West, except if they are a part of it. And this is not just belonging to any one particular group. All the immigrant groups think this. Mm -hmm. They all think this. They think that we need their help to get where we need to go. That we need their perception to get where we need to go. And it's not an attack on them. It's just an expression of reality. Before the possibilities for Adam was revealed, the Iblis took exception to him. The Iblis took exception to God's plan in him. 
before he even had an opportunity to express himself. We don't see any expression from Adam. This is the story in, in the Quran. We don't, we don't hear any expression from him before he even had any expression. Before he even had any reality is the point I'm making. Before he had any reality in the material world, in the material existence, there was already a scheme working against him. Yes. Where's the scheme? We're talking about the true human here. The true human. The true human is the one whose destiny has been focused and is the promised land. And that was what he and she are working for. That's the true human. The human that doesn't separate themselves from their human sensitivities, from their human feelings, their human warmth. They don't separate themselves from that. They don't just exist to support a material logic. They believe in these social, spiritual connections. That human, that's the one who is responsible for the existence in the promised land. But there's a strategy to separate that one that is also associated with humans. Human beings that have no social sentiments. They excuse themselves from moral obligations, moral responsibility. Morality is cheap. When it, when it, when, when it focused upon the objective, set aside morality. <laughs> There is no, I heard one say, there is no moral victories. Mm -hmm. That's nothing but the, the language of the scheme to defeat man. There's always moral obligation. There's always moral sentiment. There's always the right way and the wrong way. It's not right to refer to someone who has sacred importance in our trajectory as a people in a way less than reverent. Mm -hmm. So you can't refer not to a sensitive human being that is focused on achieving what God has set aside for us as a purpose. You can't tell that sensitive human being that has our traditional life that Elijah Muhammad should just be referred to as Elijah. Do you understand the sensitivity that has to exist? And this, I'm not speaking of something that is unique to us. This is something that moves in the soul of people that want for themselves what God has set aside for their whole, full, complete establishment. If I come before you in a form that says to you that I cheapen our history. And what I mean by that? If I come before you dressed in a way that says I am favoring someone else's picture of what our human life is, and I'm pushing out of that picture my contribution, I'm trading what. <laughs> Is that not the reality? In this country, certain clothing is considered pajamas. In another country, it's considered public formal dress. But not here. You might say, well, uh, that's Islamic. This society is not Islamic. Who told you that the way that we dress in this manner is not Islamic dress. Right. What separates this style of dress from Islam? <laughs> mm -hmm. What? The West and the history of the West. But when I look at your leadership and when I look at the influences that you have permitted in your societies, and I look at your arrogance and your attitude toward mankind as a community, a global community, you are more reflecting the worst of the West 
in their attitude toward the oppressed African American than you are of what you say is Islamic. I hear your accent. <laughs> it's more the accent of the British, which reflects their influence in your education and your spirit, but not the influence of their education on your moral self, their influence on your education to cheapen your life so that they can take for themselves resources to support their interests and their planning in the world. And you want me to call Elijah Muhammad Elijah when he acquainted us and challenged the white world mm -hmm. to acknowledge and respect this black man and woman in America. Respect their intellect. Respect their possibilities. And he didn't say it to them absent of an obligation on us. Yes. His communication was to us to command that respect. Mm -hmm. yes. So when you see us wear this dress, we're not copying anybody. We're standing in this dress, owning it for ourselves mm -hmm. in our interests. And we believe that America has been preserved so that our human interests can be expressed. It has been saved for us. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's why if you, have a, if you have a human soul and you witness what happened on January 6th, the, the attack on our, on our capital, it should have disturbed you. It should have moved you to disturbance. You shouldn't have thought, oh, uh, this is the destruction of America. No, this is the destruction of the possibilities that God has put in you to establish the promised land. Hmm. This is an attack on that. And the people who put me in prison, they knew that that was my sentiment. Mm -hmm. And they knew that I would preach this when I got out in the tradition of these hmm. influences. Now I ask you again, you getting this message in North? Yes, sir. <laughs> Today. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, let me say this. I mentioned this to the brothers last night when I came here. I want to make this clear. I don't want it to be confused. I have no interest in a residency in Newark. <laughs> So I don't want people to say that. You say, oh, he's coming to Newark because he wants to be the imam of Newark. No, I do not want to be the imam of Newark. <laughs> I don't want to be the imam of any message anywhere. I'm satisfied with this work that I'm doing right now. In the tradition of succeeding the leadership of those who are responsible for pointing us in the direction of the, prom the promised land and giving us or acquainting us with those tools that we have inherently to dig our place and to establish ourselves. So that's bigger than, bigger than any mischief on South Orange Avenue or, or any other place in the United States of America. So you brother imams in the North area, I'm not interested in your, your residency. But I am interested in you. I am interested in you. I love you. And I appreciate you for all the good works that you have done. Don't cheapen those works by encouraging your people not to support this. And I hope that you will think carefully and consider deeply what your obligations are and that when the time come for you to be asked about whether or not you mm -hmm. fulfilled your obligation as leader and this was an opportunity for you to support it and you turned away from it and not only did you turn away from it but you encouraged others to turn away from it. 
know that you will have to answer for that in the social aspirations of the people to realize what God put in them. Allah, God put in us an appreciation for social excellence and aspirations. And when we hear it, we are wanting to be aligned with it. And if you get in the way of it, you have made yourself an oppressor. And God wants us to be freed from that. I'm still OK with the time? You all still being patient with me? Yes, sir. All right. Because I don't want to burden you. I don't want to hold you longer than you, get, than you want to be held. God is my witness. I don't. But I want to get to all of what we prepared here that I believe is very important for all of us. I'm no preacher. I don't think of myself as a preacher. I don't come from preachers. I think of myself as a servant, as a helper. And I have some uh, special abilities that I believe were shaped in me for a certain time. And I don't know how long that time is. I don't know if that time is the whole space of my existence on this earth. I don't know. It might be just a few years. It might be just a year or two. I don't know how long it will be. But I know that that is what I was formed for and that uh, that is a necessary and important step for us to take as a people. Mm -hmm. A necessary and important step for us to take as a people. That there had to be leadership that came upon the, or came as a a voice from the soul of our people who belong to this tradition that was not being represented properly. Not that it wasn't being spoken of, but that it was not being represented properly. That somehow the emphasis was lost or shrouded or misplaced. and summoned from the soul of that people was a necessary voice to speak to that need, to realign ourselves with that tradition. Now, how long that's going to take, I don't know. I hope it doesn't take too long. I, I have things I want to do. I have young children. And <laughs> <laughs> I could mention some other things I would like to do too, <laughs> but I don't know if this, uh, that maybe that's just conversation for, for the men. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a natural man. I know some of y'all don't get my humor, but it's, <laughs> the brothers, they get the humor. They know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> it's not anything bad. It's good. It's in the nature. God says in the Quran, yeah, I got so much here, boy, I tell you, don't know if we're going to get to it, look at all that. God says in the Quran that whoever has regardfulness of him, fear of him, that he will give them a, an exit that he will give them a way out. Whoever has regardfulness of God. So firstly, this would be people who are sensitive to and aware of the kind of relationship that they should have 
with the moral voice that lives within them, that God deposited there. And that they are not comfortable in any way separating themselves from being or thinking of themselves as being obligated to that moral obligation, to uphold that moral obligation, to hear it in their mind and in their hearts and in their souls, their very souls, to hear it and to respond to it. That they behave in a way that they are always conscious of God's authority over them. And they never want to be separated from God's authority. They're not ashamed. Do not fear anything except God's displeasure. This kind of people. That he says that he will give them a way out, an exit. An exit from what? There's more information that we have to pursue to get to the answer for this. There's an expression in the Quran that says, the angels say to the body, release your soul. Release your soul. And in another place in the Quran, and I've mentioned this for many times, God says that, speaking of the following of Muhammad the Prophet, that you are kuntum khaira ummatin ukrijat linnas. You are the best community. Ukrijat, brought out linnas for mankind. from the same word that means exit, makrajan. So God says you are the best community brought out in the interest of mankind. Then it says to command what is right and to forbid to discourage, to cancel that which would lead to inspire people to do what is wrong. This is your role. So what is the exit? The exit is from any condition that prevent you from realizing this as an aspiration. Any condition that would limit you from realizing for yourself a role where you are a part of the liberation of man. Any reasoning, any logic, any influence, any power, any authority, false in the earth that want to subject you to an inferior understanding of your worth, God gives you an exit. Hmm. A way out. So, when the African-American leadership just after slavery trying to make sense of an American identity during the time of Jim Crow, post-slavery Jim Crow era, had no perception of what was going to be necessary to bring into existence a satisfactory life in America. That group and its constituency needed an exit. And that was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. 
That was Mr. W.D. Farad and his message, an exit from America, the sense that we have to leave in order to come back. Because if we accept how this society has characterized us, even though they're not referring to us as their slaves anymore, we will still not realize our social destiny. We will still not be satisfied with ourselves as a human community. We will still be in the care of other people and under their planning and under their focus, under their intent for our life. Something has to happen for us in order for us to come back into America. We have to have an exit. And our clinging was to God because there wasn't any other authority that we could good look, look to to satisfy us or to protect us. Every other authority abused us. Yes. So well, we could have gone back to Africa. Really? What nation in Africa wants you? Say, so, well, Ghana wants us. No, they just want your American income. They don't want you. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm telling you. They want your American dollar. They want your investment. They don't want your moral self. So you can give up your citizenship in America and go to Ghana if you like, and have dual citizenship. <laughs> You're cheapening your social trajectory that God intended for you to have as a representative of man on this earth. Yes. If you understand this tradition of leadership, then you understand that that is the focus of this tradition. A people denied, that came to an appreciation for their worth, but wasn't satisfied with just that appreciation but came to a full knowledge of what they're to be responsible for as a human creation. Mm -hmm. So as to represent to mankind the possibilities of Adam, their first father. To reconcile that for all people and for all time. In the name of the one on the eighth level, Muhammad the prophet, the one that the anthropologists say that there are 80,000 expressions of an interest to find what is man's moral destiny. That is what they're saying. When they're looking for their Lord creator, they're looking for their purpose. They're looking for their, what should be their attitude toward their existence. That which brings forth everything that is a possibility for their life and a logic of thinking that conforms to their spirit. Yes. I ask you again, you getting this message? Is this, is this the message that you're getting on Friday in Newark? Or Dallas? Or Jacksonville? Or Washington, D.C.? Or wherever you are? <clears throat> I haven't heard that message. The only time I heard that message in recent recent uh, uh, years is Imam W. Muhammad speaking. And God knows. I pray for him. I pray for his soul. I pray that what he intended to be of benefit to us benefits us. And it is my thought of him and my memory of him and my experience with him, experiences with him that have inspired and motivated me to do what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. in, spite of, in spite of being ostracized and lied on and, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, attempt to be discouraged and look at the weight that others put on you all for supporting me. They hate that you support this and so they want to hurt your spirit and hurt your relationships and ostracize you. But the promise for those who want for themselves what God intended that Adam enjoy, that commitment, as the Quran says, is stronger 
as an influence in their life than the criticism of any criticizer. Now, I wonder what they're reading in the Quran if they don't read that. <laughs> in spite of what they do, we're still motivated to get done what we have to get done. Mm -hmm. And it's going to happen, and we have signs of it. Mm -hmm. look, at the, look at what is being presented today. Look at the intellect of those persons who were presenters today to us. Look at what their commitments are. Look at what, how eloquent they are and determined they are to see those commitments realized. And they don't have to mention me. I don't care if they mention my name ever. They are living in the moment of responsibility and they are responding to the influence of this tradition that I represent. Don't buy or don't digest, don't swallow down the lies about who we are and what we're supposed to be about. Okay. Well, I'm going to skip to the end here. That's been a long time. Get to the end. Okay. The movement in us to realize for ourselves establishment of every necessary institution. Generally speaking, the social institutions, which are the highest. Do you know that our notions of justice, fairness, notions of law, systems of law, evolve out of our moral senses, out of our moral sensitivities, out of our sense of moral obligation. It is the product of the human soul. Ideas of justice, ideas of fairness, all legal systems are an expression of what is existing in the original human self that must be realized in the world as systems of government. So understand that I'm just some, not some blind patriot for America. I am a person that understands the role of government and what government is supposed to mean in the life of a people. And no Muslim who is conscious and who is aware and who is sensitive to the teaching of Muhammad the Prophet in the proper way will dismiss that obligation. If they are dismissing it or are encouraging you to rise up against your government, they are intending to oppress you. If they're interested in you having a sensitivity to rise against your own government, understand what I'm saying. I'm saying they're asking you to stand for their perception. When they are in comparison with what is a possibility for you in terms of opportunities in America begging for such <laughs> behind closed doors. Everything that they believe America has, they want. But they don't want you to have it. When they come here, they rules over there. But when they come here, they put this suit on. When they do business in the international world, in the international settings, when the deals are made and signed, they have this dress on. Not to say that this is superior to what they have. That's not the point. The point I'm making is that the language of the movement toward the social destiny is more in the hands of those who are represented in the West. Because of what? because of the influence of Muhammad the Prophet's leadership that is expressed in this tradition. Yes, sir. 
that I represent now. There's a figure, and I'm concluding with this, and I mentioned this again in our conversation with my brothers uh, last night, coming from uh, Philadelphia to here. I mentioned to them the, uh, my memory of an experience that I had with Imam W. Muhammad in Rome. And uh, this was on the occasion of the first meeting between he and Pope, the Pope of Rome, Pope John Paul II. And uh, as a part of that uh, experience, we visited the uh, Sistine Chapel. And uh, the person who was hosting us that day was explaining to us about the vision. Uh, and he, the, the person was telling us that he uh, lived virtually in that area where he was painting the, 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 uh, uh, those images. And um, uh, we went around the ceiling and we saw the different ones and the person hosting us was telling us what, who the different ones were. And um, uh, he pointed out that the, the one figure that is representing God and the other representing Adam, and he reached his finger out and not touched the finger of Adam. There's a, there's a, there's a space between the, the finger of the, the God figure and Adam. Mind you, all of the great religions have a notion of man's origin. And all of the great religions uh, have that notion with certain characteristics that are not disagreed upon. And that is seen most clearly in the heavenly religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, that call that original human Adam. And they all have that name for him, and they all have the same pronunciation. Doesn't differ. Adam the Jew, Adam the Christian, Adam the Muslim. I have an Adam the Muslim, one of my children named Adam. And uh, his name is Adam Wallace Muhammad. And uh, I believe his, his mother, she accepted that name because her father said that she should accept it, but also she accepted it because I believe that she thought that it would, him having that name would not trouble his movement any place in the world. Mm -hmm. That he could move freely any place in the world with that name. So, continuing, uh, we're looking at the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and the person is telling us about these different figures. And uh, uh, some of them are larger than others. Some are small in stature, and some are huge as compared with the others. And you would expect that certain ones will be huge. You know, the, the prophets that we hear, uh, most of the preachers of scripture and the God, God's word, we hear them make reference to these figures like Moses. You expect Moses to be big, huge, and he was in, in, this, in this reference. And also um, Abraham. He was also a big, big figure. But one that maybe you all may not expect to be big, but was huge in this 
configuration of these important scriptural figures was Jonah. And when uh, the host told us that this one is Jonah, Imam W. Muhammad, he said to me, I was standing next to him, he said to me, he said, uh, Michelangelo, he said he was either an inspired man or coached by inspired people. That was, that was his statement to me. Jonah figuring as a major and important figure. Jonah, called Yunus mm -hmm. in the Quran, was existing under the care of others and comfortable in it. Mm -hmm. After being given a special mission, and we can imagine a people who've been given a special role for one reason or another. If your humanity has been lied upon mm -hmm. and you become acquainted with what your humanity is, you become associated with movements in your spirit as a people to what your humanity is supposed to be and that you have been lied upon, you have been given a special mission. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in particular, a people that were uh, put in the circumstances that we were put in as a people. Not only that your humanity was lied upon, that you were told and uh, expected to uh, foster spread, propagate, that you are in, in, an inferior human. You're human, but not the same human as some other humans, mm -hmm. which justified their treatment of you. Once you come into a notion that that is not true, and that all these influences that have shaped your world are not true, that thick lips is not a bad thing. Broad nose is not a bad thing. Hair shriveled up on your head like a raisin is not a bad thing. You've been told that that's not the standards of beauty, that that's not the standards of excellence, that that's more belonging to the animals than to the humans. Mm -hmm. And you come to an awareness of teaching that that's not true, you should recognize that you have been chosen for a special mission. But something happened to Jonah after being designated for a special mission. He gave up the obligation. Mm -hmm. And he accepted to be carried around by other people on their products, on their commitments, on their journey, on their struggles. And when trouble came to them, and they recognized something is going on here. Now, the picture that we give in the scripture is Jonah on, on a ship. And the ship encounters stormy weather. And Jonah just relaxing. Imagine now, don't just see him as one individual figure. See him as a whole group of people, a whole people living, existing on the products and the productive spirit of another people. And they, he just may be intoxicated. This is not uh, uh, difficult to imagine. Mm -hmm. You walk right down Broad Street right. and see intoxicated people in Newark who belong to us, mm -hmm. right? Yes, I can go to Washington, D.C. right now where I grew up and see people reeling, mm -hmm. unconscious yes. of human responsibility. Yeah. I can only imagine if they have children, what's going on in that household. Mm -hmm. So intoxicated, irresponsible, loaded up with all kinds of luxuries, thinking that that represent progress. Mm -hmm. I've seen our people with that too. Haven't you? They got money, plenty money. They money to wait, money to burn, as they put it. Mm -hmm. Buying all manner of material wealth, I mean material comforts, but having no social existence to support it as a collective group. Mm -hmm. 
So are you really entitled to it? You entitled to that Porsche? Yes, I'm entitled to it. I earned the money to buy it. But look at the condition of your people. Does that enter into the equation as to what your wealth should be devoted to? Well, this is Jonah. <laughs> Living off other people's products. And I'm not talking about just one journey. I'm talking about generations of this. Yes, sir. Until finally, the people whom he is, has, has camped out with <laughs> encounter trouble. And they're looking around to find a reason why is this trouble coming at us? We're a productive lot. What in the world has happened? And they're searching the ship to find out what is going on to cause this trouble for us. And they immediately identify him as the problem. And they get rid of him, cast him out. And by mercy, he is swallowed up, as the Quran says, by a big fish, a big fish. And he's able to exist in the belly of this fish, which tell you what, that it was a comfortable, supportive environment for him. Mm -hmm. He could live there and exist, but this fish they couldn't stomach him. <laughs> and the fish spat him out yes. on the shore. Mm -hmm. Spat him out, regurgitating him, threw him up. Mm -hmm. So what is that fish? It was obviously a mammal, it was an air breather, it's breathing in air, it's supporting him, so it must be his original nature. Mm -hmm. It must be that which God created to support his life in times of good and trouble, but that he is not living up to his obligation, that it grow into its excellence as God intended it. Mm -hmm. So it threw him out. Mm -hmm. And then he recognized his mission. He recognized his obligation. And the Bible says that he said that I have a three day journey now, we're in the Sistine Chapel, and the host is telling us about M Michelangelo's vision of the importance of sacred scripture and these scriptural figures. And if we didn't know that Jonah represented a major figure, and we're following their reasoning, we would come to that conclusion for the purposes that they have. But we had already been taught by Imam W.D. Muhammad that Jonah was a major figure, which supports the notion that our leadership represents an inspired interest in progress of man on this earth. And that it is not acceptable <laughs> for us to give up that responsibility, for us to give it up and turn it over to other people who want to say to us that our leadership has no importance except to address local matters, mm -hmm. that we have no interest in the international uh, existence of man on this earth, that we have no language to address man's condition on this earth. Mm -hmm. That's not a part of our mission. That belongs to somebody else. That responsibility, that obligation belongs to other people. All we interested in is this storefront. <laughs> and, and, and collecting the charity to, to, to pay the, the, uh, the note, the rent, not even a note. <laughs> You're not paying the mortgage. You're just paying rent. Somebody else owned it. you living on somebody else's product. Somebody else built it for their interest. It was a store. It wasn't a mess yet. You made it one in your own mind, but it's still not a mess yet. Oh, brother, we make prayer. The whole earth is Allah's mess yet. Mm -hmm. That's the only true mess yet. And every other mess yet is a inferior to that mess yet. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Imam W.D. Muhammad said when the, when the, when the uh, light bill and the gas bill got so much in Chicago when he first became leader, he said he invited the people to make prayers outside in the snow. Now, how many people you think he lost that day? <laughs> <laughs> what is the, the lesson? Mm -hmm. He wasn't concerned about that loss. His concern was going in the direction that God intended for us to go. Right. And not waste time and resources. Mm -hmm. So here's Jonah with a three-day journey. A journey that recognizes, firstly, that we are formed originally with a purpose. That this is common to all of us. Mm -hmm. All of us have to embrace it. All of us have to recognize and acknowledge it. And then that purpose conforms to a particular logic that brings us to productive spaces, mm -hmm. brings us to an awareness of our own worth in the interest of serving mankind from our own special perspective, from our own perception, our own individual perception, mm -hmm. our own sacred perception mm -hmm. that begin with, with a reignition of our lifeline. lost before, mm -hmm. not known to us anymore. We were believing what the white world was saying about our humanity. Yes, sir. In spite of access to education, we were believing it, accepting that we had no strength mm -hmm. to carry our own life. Now we're at a time where America depends upon us. And this message that I have now, this is Jonah standing up in the day of responsibility and saying, I should be counted among those who accept responsibility to progress man on this earth. And productive opportunities, and we build institutions for what purpose? Eight. Eight. The number eight. The establishment, human life establishment in the purpose that God intended for man. Human life establishments, a community that has secured for itself the blessings of liberty. Does it sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Secure for itself the blessings of liberty, liberty for itself and its posterity. That is the true America. That is the fulfillment of Jonah's mission. And that is Muslim American leadership. That is W.D. Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad, Mr. W.D. Farad, and Imam Earl Abdul Malik mm. Muhammad. Thank you. Peace. Assalamu alaikum. All praise is due to Allah. We thank Allah for that special teaching and that special message. And I know, speaking for myself, I haven't heard that nowhere else except for with Imam W. Dean Muhammad. Praise be to Allah. We are concluding this part of our uh, program. Uh, we will have food served like we had yesterday. We have vendors that are here uh, expecting you to come and look at their products and services. So please do that. And before we conclude with our presentation, if you want to support this message continuing in the world as it was delivered today, you can make your generous donation. And if you would, give this envelope to Imam Duhan Abdullah, standing here. Imam Duhan Abdullah, take this envelope. <clears throat> yes. 
We would like to close out now with the dua, the plea of Imam W.D. Muhammad. And before I say this dua, this right here is beautiful. And we have excess, so you should grab one. Because what I do, this is dawah, propagation, for the next event. And the next event will be in Atlanta, Georgia, with Dr. Martin Luther King weekend observance. So we close out with the dua of the Imam W.D. Muhammad. O oh Allah, we cannot manage this. O oh Allah, we cannot manage this life without you. Please make our life what you would want it to be, what you prefer it to be. Do not permit us to act on our own. Help us to act only in obedience to you. We hear you, we obey you, we look to you for forgiveness, our Lord, and to you is our destination. Amen.